Who are you, they asked. Just what I've been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own but speak what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples, then if you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Thank you so much, William, for that reading. Good morning, welcome. It's lovely to see you here. I was going to say this beautiful summer's day, but it's like the one day of the week where we've got a bit of a breeze, which might be quite kind and respite for some of us. My name's Alan. I'm part of the team here at St. Saviour's. It's lovely to see you this morning. Before we continue, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word, which William's just read to us. And we pray, Lord, as we pause and reflect on this, that you would speak to each one of us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. William read a wonderful reading, and the claim of Jesus in that reading is Jesus just doesn't know the truth, that he is the truth. And in this passage and all other parts of John's Gospel, Jesus claims to be the truth. If we have our first slide, please, he says this. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And Jesus is speaking about himself. He makes this audacious, uncompromising, exclusive claim that he is the way to the Father. He is the way to freedom for all the things that weigh us down in life, even eternal life. Jesus is the truth. So to help us to kind of think about this, um, I've got a helper this morning, and we're going to try and have a little illustration of what it means for Jesus to be the truth. So, Michael, my helper, if you'd like to come up. Hopefully this will work. Okay, come on, come on, come on, take a stand beside me, Michael. Um, I was going to have a random volunteer, and I thought, just in case I can't get these off, <laughs> I'd better use a member of my own family. <laughs> At least I could take the responsibility. Hopefully, this will be the last time you're in cuffs. (laughs) Don't get any phone calls. That's right, hold them up. Not too tight. Brilliant, you hold your hands up like that. So, if you can think of all the things that weigh us down and stop us from having freedom, and for each of us, they might look different. It might be, maybe it's a financial worry, maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's a relationship or a lack of relationship, maybe it's a habit or an addiction. All of us will have different things that weigh us down. And these handcuffs, scale them up, people can see. These handcuffs represent the things which weigh us down and they'll look different for each one of us. But what are the things that set us free? What are the things that bring us freedom? What do you turn to when you're weighed down with the problems of life. What do you turn to for freedom? So let's have a look. So I've got some keys here. The first key is advice. Wise advice, counsel, self-help books. There's loads of things like that, isn't there, in the world. Are these things going to set us free? Sorry to say that. That key doesn't fit. There's nothing wrong with those things. These things can be great tools, but on their own, they're not going to give us freedom. So what else have I got? Money. Have you ever thought if you won the lottery, all your problems would go? Or if you just had a little bit more money, then life would be easier, finances would be sorted out? Let's have a look. Do you think this is going to set them free? Let's have a look. No, unfortunately, that key doesn't fit either. Money on its own, finances. There's lots of millionaires and billionaires, and they're still struggling with life, with relationships, with health issues. Money doesn't bring us freedom, even though we think it will do. this one. Job. What about if you get that promotion or that perfect job or the new thing that you're looking for? Do you think that's going to set you free? Let's have a look. 
Sorry to say that, Michael. That's not going to set you free either. We think if we get that promotion, don't we? Life's going to be sorted. We work our whole life. Or maybe we've been doing something for all our life, and then we retire, and we look back and we think, actually, the things that we put our value in, our identity in, our time in, on their own, those things don't bring freedom. What about love? Do you think love's going to set us free? What do you reckon? Love? Do you think love's going to set us free? Do you think so? Love of Jesus? Well, let's have a look. I'm afraid you're wrong. It's not going to set us free. You know, we think that if we have the right relationships or the, the right or children, whatever it is, if we're in that right partnership, we think that's going to bring freedom. And you speak to plenty of people in relationships and all their problems are their partners or their spouses because of anxiety and worry. That on its own is not going to bring us freedom. Ah, oh, this key says, believe in Jesus. You reckon this is going to set us free? Let's have a look. Oh no, that key doesn't fit. Believe in Jesus, what's going on there? Let's try again, shall we? No, definitely doesn't fit. So let's have a look at that verse again, but the whole verse. What does it say? Next slide, please. Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It doesn't say if you believe. It says, if you are my disciples, you'll set free. So I've got one more key here. What does this key say? Be a disciple. Let's have a look. Let's see if this will bring you freedom. Ah. Oh. 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 Lucky for you. Oh, there we go. Have a sit down. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the key part of that verse is that word disciple. Be a disciple of Jesus. And I want to look at that just very briefly in three ways of what it means of how you can be a disciple of Jesus. So the first thing is this, know Jesus. No, Jesus. Next slide, please. No, Jesus. For most of my life, I knew about Jesus. I was a pastor's son. I went to Sunday school. I knew the Bible inside and out. I knew all about Jesus. But I didn't know Jesus personally myself. And the thing about disciples was the disciples, those 12 that Jesus called, they spent time with Jesus. They knew him. They lived with him. They followed him. They listened to him. They knew Jesus, not just about him. He wasn't someone from a far off distance that they heard about, but they knew Jesus. Have our next slide, please. So last weekend, you might have noticed the church was a little bit more emptier than it is now because a lot of us were away at Focus, our church, long weekend away. And we traveled three or so hours to the north of England. We pitched up our tents. It was a heat wave. The tents were like ovens. It was a real sweat fest in the tents. Um, I, I, I lived, many of us lived on pot noodles and cup of soup for the week. Some of us who had a bit more money could go to the very expensive um, sort of booths, but um, I lived on pot noodles most of the week. Then we went to the big top. There was 5,000 of us, packed like sardines, into a big top. With all that heat, it was, it, was a, it was a sweat fest. The noise was loud. The heat was really high. And then we were worshipping the Lord, and um, the music was so loud, you can't hear yourself worshipping. And then we spent three hours traveling back, and we had to pay for this experience. <laughs> and you think, why would we put ourselves through all of this? Because we wanted to know Jesus. And the testimony of so many people, not just from our church, but from many of the other churches, was many people encountered and got to know Jesus deeper and deeper. That's why we went to focus. What do you do to spend time with Jesus? Not just on Sundays. What do you do Monday to Friday? How are you getting to know Jesus? Well, the good news is you don't have to travel to the north of England and be in a tent with 5,000 other people to know Jesus. You can spend time with him every day. Just spend some time reading scripture, praying, fellowshipping, worshipping, getting to know Jesus. Every day, spend time getting to know him. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord or your Saviour, my encouragement is that's where it starts. That's where freedom begins, by inviting him into your heart as your Lord and your Savior. Get to know Jesus. That's the first thing. Then secondly, 
Learn from Jesus. My sixth slide, please. Learn from Jesus. Disciples, learn from Jesus. The second thing about disciples is they're learners. They're not advanced teachers or experts. They're people who are open their hearts and their minds to learn more about Jesus. And if you look at the disciples in the Bible, sometimes they got this right. They asked really good questions. They said to Jesus, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And he taught them the Lord's Prayer, which many of us will know. And other times they got this wrong, and Jesus said, you know, what's going on? Ye of little faith, why have you got so much little faith? Why have you got unbelief? Why are you messing up? Why are you so slow to understand what I'm teaching you? But at the end of the day, they were open to learn. They had hearts with a desire to learn more about Jesus. The difference between the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the disciples. But the Pharisees thought they were experts and knew about Jesus, but the disciples were learners. They were learning about Jesus. They had open hearts and minds. They had the humility to say, Lord, teach us. How would you describe yourself this morning? Would you describe yourself as an expert or as a learner? So it just needs to learn more and more about Jesus. One of the things that we bought last week when we were at Focus was this Devos, it's called. It's a Bible in one year. And we've been going through it as a family, um, Bible in one year for teens, just looking at a few verses, spending a little bit of time each day, seeing what the Bible says for us that day, praying about it as a family, and just discussing Scripture. Have you got a devotional which you can look at? Or maybe for you it's books. I've got a pile of books, probably as tall as I am, which I've bought for this summer. I'm not going to be able to read all of them, but I'll, hopefully I'll get through a couple of them. But my hope is that I'll learn more about Jesus. Or maybe in the autumn it's joining one of St. Saviour's groups or joining one of the prayer meetings. How are you going to learn about Jesus, not just on Sundays, but Monday to Friday, so you can grow in this relationship because it's about a relationship. So disciples know Jesus, they learn from Jesus, and then finally, disciples keep learning from Jesus. They're people who keep learning. Someone said this, when we become Christians, we begin by learning, we keep learning, and we must never cease to learn. And the moment you stop learning about Jesus, that's the moment you stop being a disciple of Jesus. You might be an expert in the Bible, you might know your Greek and your Hebrew, you might be a great pastor or a theologian or a professor of theology, but the moment you stop learning, that's the moment you stop being a disciple. Because disciples keep learning. While we were at um, Focus last week, weekend, we got in the habit, just myself and my, my two boys, we got in the habit of getting up early, showering, and just going off somewhere quiet and spending some time just reading a few verses of the Bible and just praying, seeing what God was saying to us. Our sort of devotional time. So one morning we were sitting on the bench, having our breakfast together, reading a few verses and praying. And this guy, which I kind of knew, came and sat right by us. And I thought, why? You can see we're praying. You can see we're having a devotional time. And I was just about to um, just speak out and say, do you mind just giving us a bit of space? When I just thought the Lord was saying, well, just be open to what is going to happen in this encounter. So he came in with his two sons. And I thought he was going to say something profound. And he said, I'm waiting for my bacon. I've just ordered some food for one of the kiosks. And the bacon's going to take a while to cook. And I'm thinking, great, that's really profound and spiritual. <laughs> And then while we were sitting there, he just said, but you know what? He says, I've got some words. I think God wants me to say something over you and speak a blessing into your life. And I thought, how amazing is that? So I was just waiting for him to speak some words over us. And he said, go on, boys. And he had two sons with him. One was about 12. The other one was about nine in primary school. And they were a bit shy at first, but he was trying to say, you pray. And I think, that's great. I thought you were going to pray for us. Now you're getting your, your kids to pray for us. And these two boys, they started just to pray and, and just, just speak a few verses of blessing over me and my two sons. Because I'm a competitive dad, you know, if I was on the football pitch, <laughs> I'd expect my boys to be the best. I said, okay, that was our turn. Come on, boys, you show them what you're made of. <laughs> so, so they started praying over these two, two boys as well. So it's it lovely. And I just thought, what a beautiful moment. We just sit in there, and these four boys, 13 and under, just praying blessings over us and over the dads as well. Just such a wonderful encounter with God and move the Spirit and just seeing them step out in their faith. You know, that's God's heart for our young people. That's discipleship. God's heart isn't that they would know Bible stories, and of course we want them to know Bible stories. 
But God's heart is that they would take what they learned, the truths of the Bible, and they would put it into their everyday lives, applying it as they go through their day. God's heart is that they put the truth of the Bible into action. And that's God's heart for me and you too. That's what discipleship is. That we would keep learning, that we would grow to be more like Jesus and do the things that Jesus does. Know Jesus. Learn from Jesus. Keep learning from Jesus. And my challenge to you as we go through the summer, we're almost two-thirds through the summer, is what are you going to do, put in place in your life over this summer? Not just on Sundays when we meet together in fellowship, but what are you going to put into place to help you to know, to learn, and to keep learning more from Jesus? It doesn't matter how old we are. If we've got families and kids, we can do it together. If we're on our own, we can do it. Young or old, how are you going to know Jesus more, learn from Jesus, and keep learning from Jesus? Allow God to surprise you as you spend time with him. That's discipleship, because he is the truth.